how are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So I don't think you've ever been on Daily Star Trek News before. I don't think Allison had even ever talked to you before. I don't know. I don't think I ever. I don't think I ever was. No. So I thought it was about time. Yes. I thought we, should, <laughs> we should have you on. Your parents were Gene Roddenberry and Major Barrett Roddenberry, as I'm sure people watching this all know. Yes, uh, and for those who don't know, my father's name was Eugene Wesley Roddenberry, Senior, and of course I am the same, but with a junior. They were also basically the parents of Star Trek. So was there any sibling yep. rivalry between you and Star Trek? First of all, I love the way you asked that question because it took me a moment to understand what you were saying. And secondly, uh, if, if, I am, if I'm understanding what you're asking, um, yes. Uh, and, and you can jump in and tell me that I'm answering the wrong question in a second. But you know, when I started the documentary Trek Nation, um, uh, I, I, one of my many things that I went through was comparing myself to my father and comparing myself to the fans and comparing myself to Will Wheaton. And these, these, there, there were so many different elements of that where, um, you know, many fans came up to me and would say, you know, my father or Star Trek, you know, they, he kind of seemed like a father to them. And of course, Will Wheaton had a relationship with that. And, and these were all things that as I was hearing them and learning them brought in elements of jealousy. And, and um, I mean, that, that was certainly one of them. My father also had, you know, his home life and he had his work life and he kept them very separate. Star Trek was another family for him. It yeah. truly was. And, and, you know, as I looked into that further, there were these feelings of sort of jealousy and, and who did he love more and, and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it, the, the best part about doing that documentary was the journey that I went on and was sort of learning uh, that, that and acknowledging he had the two families. He absolutely loved me and he absolutely loved Star Trek. And coming to terms with all these things was, was, was fine. It was, you know, huge weight off the shoulders. Yeah. So, um, so yes, there, there was somewhat of a, a rivalry, maybe not sibling in the way that you're saying, but a rivalry definitely internally for me, sure. uh, if, if that answers a piece of your question. So was it, was it making the documentary that helped you come to terms with that? Well, the documentary took uh, well, 10 years to do, and so it was a long, long journey, mostly because uh, I had never done one before, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I had great, talented people all around me who, who certainly knew more than me in, in, in many respects, and so it was a journey trying to figure out the path and, and getting lost along the way and going on tangents and, and, and new directions and, and making mistakes. It, it was during... The, the the discovery and it was during the journey of that documentary and of course not to get all philosophical life is a journey and I'm always learning and I'm always evolving and hopefully I'm always growing in a in a more positive direction well hopefully. I mean that's that's a very Star Trek message you you eventually came to create the Roddenberry Foundation um, yes uh, what was the genesis of that well, uh, that was basically after my mother passed away, and um, you know there there had been some philanthropy in the in the family uh, a little bit. I mean, my parents were giving people, but they didn't have a foundation, and they did what most people do. I think when they felt uh, passionate about something, they 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 supported it by either uh, voicing their their support of it or or by contributing financially to it. Um, we just sort of formalized that by creating a family foundation. Um, you know, I, 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 through the, the journey of Star, of, of Trek Nation, the documentary, you know, I, I discovered more of who I was and I knew I wasn't going to be Gene Roddenberry. Of course, no one could be Gene Roddenberry and I did not want to be Gene Roddenberry, but I also learned I was not necessarily going to be the next person carrying on Star Trek, um, and I, I, but I truly loved Star Trek. And I, of course, I love Star Trek today. And it's not just the TV shows, but more than anything, way more than anything, I do love, as we discussed before, the philosophy, the ideology. I want that future to be our future. We do not have to have starships that are named Enterprise, but you know what I'm saying. I want humanity to succeed in that way. It, essentially, the foundation was my way of saying, well, if I'm not going to create something that, that's, that's entertainment-based, that inspires people, maybe we can put our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and create an entity that 
that that finds these individuals, finds these organizations that are working towards the long term advancement of our species. And maybe we can, through them, continue to inspire people by saying, look at this amazing company. They're working on uh, uh, stem cells. Uh, they're, they're, they're cleaning up um, uh, 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 sewage water and making it drinkable. They're creating energy from nothing. Whatever the case is, let's, let's find these people. Let's support them and let's show the world that there are people who are trying to make that Star Trek future a reality. And you do that in a number of ways at the foundation. You have a bunch of prizes and programs. The Roddenberry Prize, um, you award that to uh, people that are trying to use science to build a better a better future. Um, what are some of the companies that have won and how did they how did they qualify? What are you looking for when you're awarding that prize? These are I certainly don't want to say startups. They're not necessarily startups. Um, we, we have an incredible team that does a lot of due diligence uh, they, they reach out and they find organizations who are doing, as I said, working on the, the, the cutting edge and working towards that long-term advancement, but trying to find ones that are really going, either making a dent or going to make a dent. Um, and, and these aren't just whimsical ideas of, hey, I'm going to create a new kind of energy. Um, these are people who have taken a few steps forward from where we are right now. And, and they, they're kind of doing what my father did with Star Trek. He extrapolated. He talked to people at JPL and Caltech and, and said, you know, okay, what do we have today? Okay, what are we going to have 50, 100, 200 years from now? Sure. And we're, we're finding the organizations who are looking at our issues like that and our technologies like that today. Um, so so having, having a good team to, to find them and then having uh, the right people to sort of vet them. And then, of course, us getting to talk to them and get to meet them and, and making sure that they sort of fit the ideology of working towards the long-term advancement of our species. So uh, th that is the most crucial part of our prize programs. The Roddenberry Fellowship, which you founded in 2016, is awarded to extraordinary leaders and advocates who use new and innovative strategies to safeguard human rights and ensure an equal and just society for all. Can you break that down for me a little bit? Well, first, uh, first, let me take a moment to recognize the fact that, you know, this, uh, this foundation is uh, definitely not something that I run and not something that I run single-handedly at all. Um, we, we have four board members um, uh, who are, well, uh, on the board. Anyhow, we've got a great team of people who actually do the hard work, the legwork, the, the, the research that I've been talking about, the ones that come to the board and say, hey, you know, the program that we all agreed on starting – here are the list of candidates, you know, and, and here, here, and we've whittled them down from the, the thousand entries to the, to the 10 right here. So, so I, I get to sit on the board and have this sort of a bird's eye view and, and, and get to um, benefit from the hard work they've done. So I just want to recognize them first. Secondly, um, the, the fellowship uh, was, was, I mean, actually I, I, an idea, I believe, of Lior Ips, um, our CEO. And the, the, he's out there finding um, every, every two years, we find a group of anywhere between 15 and 20 individuals who are, as you just described, uh, making an impact in their community, uh, making a significant in cap, in, uh, impact in their community. And, and for the last, well, well, four plus years, it's been really focused on social justice, not to get into politics, but uh, I, I wasn't a fan of our, of our last uh, president um, and, and felt in terms of social justice, in terms of that Star Trek future, in terms of a world where inclusion is the defining word as opposed to exclusion, um, I did not feel and we did not feel that um, there were uh, enough uh, leaders in the civil rights area. So we went out and found leaders in the civil rights area. So it, it could be relatively small in terms of they are helping out their community. Um, or larger, where they're helping up a broader community, but people who are really trying to make a difference there. It, it's a little bit of an outlier when I say the, the 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 Star Trek ideology, but it isn't in the sense that in the Star Trek future we live in a world of social justice. There's a world of equality, regardless of skin color, background, gender, identification, whatever whatever the case is. Um, so it's important to have the people out there that are. Uh, paving that way and giving uh, opportunity to those who are not fortunate enough to get it.
Our catalyst program is 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 very cool. That that is sort of our smaller uh, prize or smaller contribution program, yeah. uh, where anyone from around the world and and people do from all around the world submit their ideas for. I mean, anything from a new app to help people get to the doctor quicker in a third world country, or or uh, a new way to uh, get uh, filter rainwater uh, so villages can have them. They're they're. I don't mean to talk about them as insignificant at all. They are incredibly significant. They are just more of the here and now sort of solutions. They're not the long-term solutions. Now, some of these ideas that are submitted could blossom into larger, and and, and that's our hope is yeah. that you know this this small town that came up with this idea or this uh, app in in whatever uh, this city in in South Africa. We're hoping that. Its success explodes and and goes everywhere, sure. um, but it, we're, we're, those are usually about fifteen thousand uh, dollar contributions. And by no means is that a small number. It's just relatively small compared to our prize, which is up in a million dollar range. So, sure. yeah. uh, and these are not insignificant numbers, of course. Sure. Um, and another thing, I quickly want to say that that we've been supporting an organization in uh, San Francisco called the Gladstone Institute um, for. Over 10 years now, I believe. Yeah, over, yeah, definitely over 10 years. And I don't know if this is common knowledge today, but uh, one of their scientists pioneered the uh, um, pluripotent stem cells, uh, which were this, as we know, stem cells, well, as some of us know, stem cells are taken from a fetus, traditional stem cells. Um, the technology has been out for a while now, thanks to this scientist, uh, where they can take... Uh, any cell from an adult male, let's say an adult male skin cell, and they reverse engineer it into almost any sort of human cell there is, liver cell, heart cell, brain cell, you name it. Um, and they can grow that so you get a, a, a mass of heart cells or a mass of brain cells or, or muscle cells, whatever the case may be. And you know, it, it's incredible to think that you can maybe one day uh, engineer a heart or a liver or, or something like that. But at the very least, what you can do is test medicines on them. Because if someone with a heart condition, uh, not every kind of heart medicine will work on them. And, and what heart medicine works on me might not work on you. Sure. So, and, and that can have very detrimental effects to the other person. So being able to test uh, in a test tube, essentially, on these cells and, and study the effects, you can find the optimal one without killing your patient, which is ideal. That's, um, that's amazing. That's <laughs> but really there's so many things that they do even beyond that. But uh, we, I, I love that organization. Anyone who's fascinated by this stuff, I highly recommend checking them out. Securing a Star Trek future and doing all these good works uh, doesn't come cheap. So where does your funding come from? Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's us. We, 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 we've, uh, my, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate and my, uh, my, uh, uh, my mother and father, um, they, they worked very hard their entire lives, obviously. Um, my father, my father really didn't receive a, a profit participation patient check for Star Trek until I believe the story is 1982 after, um, he, he, he actually, got the auditors in and audited Star Trek because, you know, he had been told up to that point that it had been a failure and, and studios have and continue to, uh, do, do, well, they have creative accounting like a lot of large businesses sure. and they can fold things into other things and then sell them that way and say, see, it didn't make any money because they sold it with something that was not as valuable. Um, so, you know, once you get the, um, unfortunately, God, I hate saying this, but once you get the lawyers involved, you get the, the right lawyers involved, at least the lawyers on your side, huh. they do the digging and the auditors get in and, and you can see. Anyhow, long story short, um, <laughs> all this is to say, uh, my, my family has done well. My mother and father gave me an, the incredible gift and legacy of Star Trek. Um, and they're, I, I am very fortunate and fortunate enough where I'm more than happy to uh, uh, put that money into other areas. Sure, that's great. But don't, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sound like I'm the nicest guy in the world giving everything away. Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm doing just fine and I, I take care of myself as well. 
and my loved ones and my son. Do you take donations or anything? The foundation hasn't really done that yet. Um, we've we've talked about it internally. One day we might do some sort of matching campaign. Um, um, I, I would I would it it's the fans who love Star Trek already give their money. They pay for Star Trek. They buy merchandise. They go to conventions. You know, they 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 already do that. So the 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 only thing we might do one day is say, if you really love this this technology, this idea, this way of making a better future, and if you have money that you want to contribute to do that, we are happy to sort of sponsor that and perhaps even match that and and something. But it, it just doesn't necessarily feel right to say, hey, fans, give us more money, <laughs> even though it's not going to us. Still, doesn't necessarily feel right. So is there a way that uh, fans can help or just keep going to conventions and keep going, keep watching Star Trek? Well, the foundation and entertainment side of Roddenberry are very, are two very different things. And we've recently, we've in this discussion have talked about the foundation and that's the philanthropy that's making the world a better place um, in terms of fans helping. Um, I mean, certainly go to the, if you're, if you're interested in cool technologies, methodologies, and what the Roddenberry family is actually trying to do to help make the world a better place, please go to roddenberryfoundation.org and, and check it out. Um, a number of our programs in there, um, they, they're, you're welcome to submit your ideas. Um, in terms of keeping the Star Trek dream alive, yeah, I mean, obviously keep watching it. Um, um, sh share, 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 share your ideas there, although most of those will go to CBS or Paramount. Um, no, I mean, keep loving Star Trek. And when we, and I say we, and the Star Trek community, Paramount, CBS, Roddenberry, when we do something wrong or, or not Star Trekian as a whole, we, please feel free to let us know. And, and uh, we're open to feedback and we're open to criticism. But what's important to me is, is feedback that says, not just you suck or you're doing it wrong, but <laughs> if you have to say you suck, okay, but you suck because... Explain it and please make it a, a logical, coherent explanation that we can understand. And we still may disagree, but at least we can have the dialogue and the understanding that you didn't like it for these reasons, as opposed to you suck. Sure. And you know what? It's a free country. If you really want to say you suck, uh, by all means do. We're probably not going to read it. <laughs> You're looking for constructive criticism rather than just to put down. You're one of the producers on, I think you're a producer on all the Star Trek shows that are currently. Uh, uh, executive producers. Executive. Yeah, there's, there's many executive producers on many of the, on all of so the shows. That is actually my second question about this. My first question is, did, how, did they, did Alex Kurtzman or somebody approach you and say, would you come be an executive producer? Did you approach them? Or did it happen organically? How did you get involved in the Star Trek shows? It, it 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 basically happened where we were informed that uh, we, we I think knew pretty early on that Alex was interested in in kind of uh, bringing Star Trek back. And as it became more real, um, they came to us because, you know, we have certain deals in place with uh, 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 Star Trek. and in 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 talking about those deals, we said, yes, we'd and we'd love to have a seat at the table. I mean, with this, this Star Trek can exist without Roddenberry, but Roddenberry Star Trek cannot exist without Roddenberry. And by that, I mean, there's certain Star Trek out there that can just be seen as science fiction. Um, but when I say Roddenberry Star Trek, I mean the kinds of episodes that make you think, that make you consider new points of view, that still entertain you. I mean, the most, the, the, the best Star Trek, when it's firing on all cylinders, is when you watch a show, you're engaged, you're blown away, and then you've actually, within that period of time, realized that you've, you've seen a different point of view that's, that's, that's conflicted with your own and made you consider, I never thought of it that way. Huh, if I were in that situation, would I do it that way? And, and when you start having that dialogue either with yourself or the people around you, that's when Star Trek's at its best. And that's when humanity's growing because we're now exposed to a different idea that we hadn't considered before or a different perspective, and we're considering it. That's how we evolve intellectually. I have what's basically a two-part question. First sure. of all, 
uh, as you mentioned, there are like 4 million and 12 executive producers. So yes. uh, <laughs> question part A is, what do you all do? And uh, question part B is, how involved do you get in the the writing and the running of Star Trek to preserve that uh, Roddenberry Trek uh, feel? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question in a very general sort of way. Um, yeah. The the an an executive producer in television can do anything from be the showrunner there every day in the writers' room on the set. Um, nose deep in it and you know alex kurtzman's an excellent example of of that um and then there can be executive producers who are simply brought in for the legacy because their last name is roddenberry now initially i mean that was sort of my approach but you know having a seat at the table uh we do contribute we're, we're not on the inside creative circle but we're right on the edge of that and so of course everything that comes out of out of the, the writing rooms, you know, com comes to us. And as you said, there are many executive producers and many people who look at it, but we are certainly one of the ones who look at it and we share our notes and ideas. And uh, we, we have, uh, of course, uh, plenty of weekly calls for all the shows. And uh, I mean, again, I, what I'm trying to do is not take credit as any sort of uh, major creative force in all the new shows. There's a lot of creative people who are making them happen, yeah. but there are plenty of things that we catch from time to time and we suggest from time to time that, that either don't seem to fit Star Trek or don't seem to fit Roddenberry Star Trek. And we, we share what our solutions might be to that. And, and like any uh, collaborative uh, uh, group, they look at it and they say, oh, good catch. Or, yeah, no, we're, we're, doing, we're, we're going in this other direction. Sure. And so that's, I mean, that's how it works. Well, thank you so much, Rod. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you so for much. your time. Hey, everyone, live long and prosper.